was uh, talking with some friends who were not Buddhist, and uh, the issue of, of suffering came up, which was not uncommon. Um, and I was trying to explain to a, a fellow uh, about the Buddhist concept of suffering. And the more I said, the less he understood. So I, w I didn't do a very good job of explaining this concept. And uh, so I got out my tried and trusty what the Buddha taught by Wapola uh, Rahula and uh, was looking through there and I thought, okay, well, I've, over the years I've shifted my emphasis on what the meaning of dukkha was, because dukkha is the word that the Buddha used. Dukkha is a, is a complex word. One of the things about Sanskrit is that it's extremely concise in talking about spiritual things. Um, and it leaves little doubt what's going on. But dukkha is a word that is, is very much loaded because it does mean uh, discontent and dissatisfaction. And uh, I, I realize that I've, I've just shifted to that, basically because most people experience discontent and dissatisfaction in their daily life. And uh, when we talk about suffering, we don't normally think of people as suffering every day of their life. You know, maybe they suffer once a week or once a month, uh, depending on who they are. And it, it comes to the, the, the issue of what is actually suffering. Well, good old uh, Wapola Rahula, he, he went right through discontent and dissatisfaction right on to the word suffering. And then it made me think today, because I thought about that, and I thought, eh, okay, so I've, sometimes we get lopsided because we keep pushing one facet of something. And um, Bhat Hai came in and told me he wasn't going to be able to be here on a, a right, right away for class, because we normally have a 930 sutra class, which right now we're doing the platform, platform sutra of the Sixth Patriarch. And... Um, he had a friend that committed suicide. Well, within the, the ideas of Buddhism, we do recognize suffering. But suffering isn't what most people are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. But certainly when someone commits suicide, we have to assume that they were suffering greatly. And it's, it's something more than just discontent and dissatisfaction. Um, And of course, to commit suicide, it's, it's uh, the ultimate statement you can make in trying to get away from whatever it is that's making you unhappy. And you have to be very, very unhappy. Now, as Buddhists, we recognize people that commit suicide as really suffering from mental illness. This is assuming that they're good Buddhists. If, they're, if they belong to some other uh, religious or philosophical path, it's possible that they could be sane and they just, that's the only out that they could find. A good example is someone who's in constant overriding pain and who finally decides that they can no longer deal with that pain. So they, uh, I think of cancer victims and Philip Kaplow, who wrote the seminal work, Three Pillars is in. The next book he talked about, I think it was his next book, he talked about death and people that are in the hospital in a terminal disease who are on a morphine pump and it's not doing any good anymore. And so that they, they asked to be liberated from life. Now, I have to tell you that there's a traditional Buddhist notion about this, and it's very Hindu. And the notion is that the longer that you can deal with the pain, the more that you will absolve yourself of karmic traces. Because if you think that the point of life is to keep moving towards a state of purity and that karma and 
the, the retribution. I don't like the, the Buddhists use the word retribution all the time, but to me, retribution means somebody's doing something. You you receive retribution because you were found smoking at the back of the gymnasium, so the principal gives you swats when I was a kid. Okay, that's retribution. But that's the way they talk about it, and it's sort of really more like a karmic bill. But in Buddhism, we don't have either one. But we, we talk about it as if we do. In other words, we look at life and we try to explain, and this is a question that all people ask, and in, in all, as far as I know, in all the religious traditions, why do bad things happen to a good person? And it's a, it's a very hard thing to answer if, if you think that somebody's making the bad things happen. Okay? If there's a deity involved, and if you're a good person, then you should, your life should be good. That's the basic notion, that everything should be okay. You shouldn't have any problems. People are nice to you. Your car never breaks down. Your house never burns down. You don't go to the pharmacy to get some medicine and find out it's $144 and you have $15 in your wallet. All of those things, those things, uh, they, don't, they don't happen to uh, people that are good. But we know that they do happen to people that are good. All kinds of conditions, good and bad, happen to people who are what we would call good and bad. Because within the framework of Buddhism, we don't believe there's anybody making things happen. Now, this begs the question of karma. Well, what about karma? Aren't you, aren't you uh, born to this bad condition that you suffer with because of karma? Maybe. I, I happen to think karma exists, but I don't think it, it causes suffering. I think we cause suffering. In other words, uh, if you're born and you're not very intelligent, but you're intelligent enough to realize you're not very intelligent, that's reasonable, right, Jane? There are, there are people that aren't very bright, but they know they're not very bright. Um, we could say that was a product of karma and that that person is put on this earth to do menial tasks and be treated poorly and to essentially suffer because they're not very smart. In the newspaper there was a story, which there always is, of a group of people being very mean to a person that wasn't very smart and uh, they essentially killed him. They harassed and, and, and hazed him to the point that they beat him up and he died. And of course, this is being treated as a hate crime because this person was um, what we used to call retarded. So some people would say, well, that was his karma. I, I don't think it was his karma. I think it was a bunch of people that were basically jerks picking on this person that that had limited mental faculties. But let's go back to suffering. Suffering, as Nagachita used to say repeatedly, he had about four things that he said over and over again, and he said suffering is a choice. It's not a foregone conclusion. The high school I used to work at, we had a county class. In a county class, they came in two varieties. They came extremely emotionally disturbed children who were highly medicated, which is not what I'm talking about. And then we had this, what we used to call as retarded. We talked about the kids with very low IQs that really were, could not read, and so they were taught some basic skills. One of the things I noticed about these children, one of the things they did is after lunch, they would pick up the trash that the intelligent students left on the ground and they would come around and they were all smiling and they were happy because when they got done they took great satisfaction in the fact that the campus grounds were now clean and there's a lesson in that it's not what you have it's what you do with it 
And so uh, some people uh, are unhappy all their life because they never got recognized for some talent they had. I used to tell Puja when we built this temple, when we got done with a piece of it, I'd stand back and I'd say, man, are we talented. We did a great job. And Puja would look at me and I'd say, you know, if you don't compliment yourself, nobody else is going to do it. So you have to keep, because we were alone here. You know, there was nobody coming around going, oh boy, look what you did, that's great. So I said, it's amazing, isn't it? We actually put it up and it didn't fall down. Uh, that is a very Buddhist way of approaching things. You know, I get together with people every month and I play guitar. It's never crossed my mind to worry about who the best guitar player is. I do think about who's having the most fun. And if they're not having fun, then I feel sorry for them. Because whether you can play four chords or you can play every chord that was ever invented is irrelevant. It's whether you're enjoying what you're doing. And if you're not enjoying playing the guitar, then you need to go get a harmonica or something, buy a piano or learn to do watercolors or plant a garden, do something that you enjoy. Suffering is, I don't want to be here. I used to tell my high school students that boredom is not a thing. Boredom doesn't exist. Boredom is you don't want to be here. No matter how entertaining I can be, if you don't like what I'm saying, you don't want to be here. So now you disconnect from the, from the world. And when you disconnect from the world, well, I don't think there's necessarily suffering, but there certainly is a lot of dissatisfaction about disconnecting from the world, not wanting to be where you're at. <clears throat> but to get back to this fellow that committed suicide, if he was a Buddhist, we'd say he's mentally ill because we believe he's coming back. And since he's coming back, he can't escape who he is. Now, he won't be Bob. I don't know what his name was, but Hyde didn't tell me, but I'll say Bob. He won't come back as Bob. The Buddha took that away from the Indians because in, in uh, India, they believe when someone reincarnates, it's that person. That, that person, that personality reincarnates through a series of many, many lives. And the Buddha said, okay, I found one more thing you can get hung up on. You can get hung up on the idea that you are going to be rewarded for a good life. Okay, so the Buddha said, the reason to lead a good and reasonable life is not so you get a reward. I want you to think of the religions that talk about rewards for being good. The reason why you lead a good and reasonable life is because that's what good and reasonable people do. The reason you take care of other people is that you see yourself in them. Not so that you can have a reward after you die. And it becomes so absurd within the, the realm of Buddhism that we get to the point where we throw away the idea of stopping the wheel of life. And we have a personage, or a type of personage, that repeatedly does that, and that's the Bodhisattva. For those of you like Mary that has taken the Bodhisattva vows, she promised not to stop until everyone's enlightened. Do you know how many years that's going to take? Well, the sun's going to burn out in four and a half billion years. It's going to be slightly longer than it takes the sun to burn out for all people to become awakened. So in that simple vow of I will continue until all people are awakened, you damn yourself to rebirth after rebirth after rebirth. You do not damn yourself to suffering. You can choose to be in a state of suffering or you can choose to simply be uncomfortable or in pain, or maybe not as happy as you could be that you got passed over for that job, or maybe not as happy as you could be that you didn't get that title you wanted. But the longer you look at it, you realize it's okay. So you can play your four chords on a guitar, or you can plant your herb garden, which we have, by the way. 
I got water going to it yesterday. I've got to find lemongrass somewhere, and that's the only thing I'm missing, if anybody knows who's got lemongrass, just so these guys can figure out how to cook with it. Okay. So I downgrade the notion of suffering, not that people don't suffer, but I downgrade that because once you realize that you can only suffer if you want something that's impossible for you to have, and you won't recognize that it's impossible for you to have, or you can only really suffer if you want to keep something that's going away. And everything in the known universe is going away. Everything is changing. So you don't get to live forever. You don't get to be pretty forever. I like your beard, by the way. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that you trimmed it all up. That looks good. I like your mala. <laughs> Do you? I just got it this morning. Yeah, Bui Mung keeps me constantly on my toes. I never know what's going to happen. You can only suffer if you will not accept the fact that life is in constant flux, that change is always happening, and you don't confuse the daydream. I was a big daydreamer when I was a kid. You can't, don't confuse the daydream for reality. And when you can throw your arms around reality and enjoy it 100%, if you only enjoy it 99%, talk to Jane. She'll get you over that one more percent. Okay? Because life, this life, as Dogen might have said if he said it, is the absolute best life you'll ever have. Mm -hmm. 